Hello and welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast, produced in partnership with the A.B. Corcor Foundation for Mental Health. I'm Terry, the creator and co-host of this podcast. I've lived with depression most of my life, and I know how easy it can be to feel all alone in the experience. I'm not alone, and you aren't either. And I'm Dr. Anita Sands, a licensed clinical psychologist and life coach with a number of my own diagnoses, all of which bring a certain amount of anxiety and depression along with them. There is great power in shared experiences. We share our own as we engage in intimate and candid conversations with our weekly guests, exploring different perspectives on and experiences with depression. We keep it real because depression is real. We keep it hopeful because there truly is hope in spite of what depression tells you. Hello, Anita. Hi, Terry. A couple of weeks ago, we asked those of you who listened to this podcast to let us know if you'd like to hear the occasional extended version of the conversations that we have with our guests. And the vast majority of those who replied said yes. And then we interviewed Todd Rennebaum about how to talk to children about depression, hospitalizations, and even suicidal thoughts and attempts. Today, we'll learn more about Todd's children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries, as well as more of the story behind that story. For those of you who prefer shorter edited versions, check out last week's 19-minute episode, number 255. To be honest, we had another episode recorded, edited, and ready to go for today. But when we saw the reaction to Todd's story, we realized this was just the kind of topic, conversation, and guess that would work for a deeper and more candid and unvarnished dive. So today, you'll hear more of how he came to distill what he's learned on his journey that he believes could help other parents do a better job of being age-appropriately real with their children. Here again is Todd Rennebaum giving his voice to depression. Um, Let's start with just you, if you're ready. Tell me about you. Just give me a little introduction to Todd. Uh, Like who I am today or like my whole Um, back? story no i don't need your whole backstory (laughs) you know who you are old you are and sort of like your relation to relationship to mental health Gotcha. okay Uh, my name is todd rennebaum i live in a very small town indian head in the province of saskatchewan in the country of canada uh i am 45 years old and i'm six years sober um i've been advocating for mental health uh for about a little over six years. Um, it really ramped up once I got sober. And uh, yeah, the, the during the pandemic, I got bored. So I started the podcast. Um, I wrote a kid's book called Sometimes Daddy Cries. Uh, that was four years in the making. Uh, actually, the uh, first draft of that book was uh, my last night of drinking. It was actually... It was almost like a suicide note, to be honest with you, when I, the first draft. How, how so? How would that book have been that? Um, so I was really, really drunk and high when I wrote it, the first draft. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had, uh, so there, I mean, there's lots of backstory, but I, I eventually turned to just drinking by myself and using by myself in my garage every night. Uh, there's no more parties. There's no more hosting. So, um, and I had tried stop drinking many times. I've tried stop using weed many times. And uh, that night, I I went into the house and I I took all the alcohol in the house. And I my plan was I'm going to drink all the alcohol in the house. Next morning, I'm going to go to my wife and be like, "Look, there's no alcohol in the house. Let's let's keep it this way because if it's in here, I'm going to drink it. So let's please stop bringing alcohol in the house." But um, what ended up happening was I just got so incredibly drunk um i was always i mean i was having suicidal thoughts for several years and i had already had a suicide attempt at one point so um yeah i ended up getting really drunk or really depressed really you know suicidal that night uh and i remember sitting there having this idea of a of writing a kid's book it was almost like almost like an apology to my kids um or an apology to my wife and everyone around me 
Um, and so, I mean, I, I say it was kind of like a suicide note because it was going to be the last thing I did before I died. So, um, and it was, I mean, it was a very different, uh, like that was a very different draft than what the final draft is, but it, it was ultimately, you know, it was basically, this, it was along the same lines, uh, a child watching his dad go through depression. Um, so I wrote it, typed it out on my computer. I left the screen open and then I had, uh, yeah, and then I sat for a while. I was crying, and I, I, I was trying to decide: do I go through with it, or or what happens here? Um, and and I mean, like I said, I was really drunk and high, so it's the, my my memory's a little blurry. But um, ultimately, I guess what happened was I, I woke my wife up. It was like three in the morning, uh, and I said, "You, I'm gonna hurt myself," and y- you know help i guess you know like I, i'm gonna hurt myself so you, you know, like we gotta do something or yeah something's bad it's gonna happen uh luckily i ended up going to the bathroom and just like getting sick and like i like even if i wanted to hurt myself i don't think i could because i was so inebriated uh while my wife was trying to figure out what to do and calling places and and uh ultimately uh she loaded me in the car and took me to my local hospital which is so in Saskatchewan there's there's nine one one, but um we're in a very small town and I would have been it, it, we only live like five blocks from our hospital. It would have been really costly, it was a real pain in the ass, but the the provincial government at the time was was promoting um I wanna say it's eight one one. I can't remember what the number was, but it was like a health line thing. Uh there was mm-hmm. there was like a, a a massive amount of suicides in the province at that time. Uh, especially in the well, mostly in the indigenous communities uh so then they were promoting this health line uh, so she called that and they gave her the advice to if she was able to load me in the car and just take me to my local hospital uh so she did that and that was the last time i drank wow i got high after that <laughs> <laughs> for about 5 days in the parking mm-hmm. lot of the hospital until my doctor said no don't don't do that anymore but yeah wow okay so this story is not from i did this great job normalizing depression and making it just like having a tummy ache and so (laughs) i wanted to share how well i had done this with other parents that was not the basis of this story no it was basically me learning from my mistakes and trying to help others avoid you know like there's tricks of the trade you know when you're working with a carpenter they're like hey instead of taking 10 years to learn this trick here it is now (laughs) you know (laughs) you'll avoid a lot of uh uh you know time and issues so yeah that yeah and it's it's been i gotta tell you it's been amazing like the feedback i get and and the what am I trying to say? So I'm really bad at tooting my own horn, by the way. So this is uh, very well, humbling. Two of us. It's weird. Yeah. It's like to to talk about myself is humbling, which it should be the other way around. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. So so anyway, I, I I'm getting all types of amazing feedback from people that I didn't even think I was helping. You know what I mean? Like, so parents are saying this. It's just great because it's. Um, sparking the conversation with children about mental health uh it's great for uh wives and mothers that are watching their husbands go through these situations so that it's, so it's also um normalizing it for for the wives it's also normalizing it for the men so then the the men that read it are like oh you know this is a normal thing um oh uh, someone else too someone else some other kind of group the kids yeah, and kids are, are yeah are, are uh, relating to it, and there's in and they're seeing it in their parents and in themselves, and um, so so kids are not they're not because I mean I, I've talked to a lot of people that have grown up in a household who had a mother who was bipolar, or a father that was an alcoholic or whatever, and so now they they're they're kind of getting they're finding empathy even at a young age for their parents. They're like, Oh, they're actually going through something. They're not just, I'm not taking it personally. I'm not going to, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, 
I might have some resentments later in life a little bit, but now at least I can understand that grownups go through stuff too. And so, um, you know, kids are learning about empathy, empathy from, from the book because of the book. I think it'd be easier to have empathy if somebody, if you're saying, yes, this is an illness, I experience illness. Right. Uh, you know, I'm laid out on the couch when I'm sick. He's here. He you know, my parents are laid out on the couch when they're sick. Oh, that's the other thing. Yeah. Sorry. Go for it. it. Is making it relatable to kids by making it a physical thing so then they can relate. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I remember going to the hospital because of my stomach ache. I remember taking medicine because of my med- uh, stomach. I remember not being able to go outside and do things and, you know, have a, a normal day because of these physical ailments. So then they, yeah, they can relate that back to the mental part and be like, oh, okay, it is just like this and not to hold judgment or, you know, have empathy and, and understand it better. Or take it on, right? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's a parent doesn't think, oh, this is my fault. He's got a stomach ache, you know, and, and a kid doesn't have to think, oh, it's my fault you know, my parent is depressed, whereas it can be real easy, especially if they're angry, to think that it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm curious, what did you, I mean, be brutally honest, I'm curious what your thoughts were of the book. I liked it. I liked the gentleness of comparing it to a a physical, because it is, because your brain's in your body. Mm -hmm. Um, I liked the eye gray and and laid out on the couch when I'm sick. Daddy's gray, and and, and I mean that literally, obviously, by the illustration. Um, I like that I still love you even when you're sick. You still love me even when I'm sick. You know, mm-hmm. I think there are a lot of great lessons in it. Oh, good, um, good. Yeah. Um, and the illustrator, I mean, I, I sent this out to a couple um, publishers, and I always got the feedback that the illustrations were too, they weren't fluffy enough. It wasn't like, mm-hmm. I need a fluffy little kitten or something. It's like, mm, mm-hmm. yeah, but I mean... That's not what it's like. I don't. I don't want to make it so fluffy that kids don't have some kind of emotion when they're reading the book. I also don't want it so dire uh, that you know it's you know unrelatable or or scary for kids. So I, I think between the illustrations and the dialogue, I think we straddled that line nicely. Where it's like this is realistic. This is what it looks like, but it's not fluffy. I didn't make it fluffy, and I also didn't make it too scary, I think. I would agree. Oh, good. I would agree. Good. That's that's what took so long, I think, was the four years. If you were to pick a takeaway, like, you know, if a child is to read this book, I would like them to understand blank as a result. I would like them to understand that mental illness and mental health issues are just as common and just as normal as having a physical ailment or a physical issue and that it is treatable. Sometimes you need medicine. Sometimes you just need rest and that it happens to everybody just to basically normalize mental health and mental illness issues. If you were to write a book for an adult audience, what would you want the takeaway to be? Oh, man. Um, interesting, probably almost the exact same message, really. Um, and maybe add the part that, you know, just cause you're a man that, that, you know, it's okay to be unhealthy in the brain and, and take care of yourself and you're not, um, oh, what do I, sorry, there's, there's. I have a couple of things I always say, and I can't remember what the hell the one. Oh, I like it when people say things they don't always say. Uh, well, not weak, not flawed, not broken. No, I mean, it's, those are uh, the things that. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? I'm not. Mm, I'm so sorry, Terry. It's driving me nuts. I don't. I, know, well, I can't get it. it up. It'll come to you at some point, and it doesn't have to be the same word you always use. It can be what it means. But, but it's it's the perfect word. It's the perfect word. I had someone do that to me in an interview. I said, I can't think of the word. And he said, tell me what it means. And I said, oh, my God, that was so gentle. And he said, that's how I do it to myself. Yeah, yeah. And it was a vet who, you know, and I was like, I love so it like, when people are gentle. I'm not capable. I'm not. I feel un. It's an unword. I feel un. Worthy? No, it's like I'm not. I'm, I'm not. 
I don't have the capacity to be a man because I'm not. Ah, this is bonkers. It's just a word. Okay, well we it's we'll just, just a skip word. It. <laughs> yeah, we'll skip the word. We, like, we don't have to. Okay, we don't, and we don't have to worry about that word. So anyway. really, it's the same message for adults too, because it is the same message um, that you're not. And you'll but come it is up different with, it, with you know, men, though. I, it is like I'm. I'm yeah. not. Um, I'm not that word that explains everything I want to say perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Uh, it's not unmasculine. No. It's not un. That's that. We'll, we'll, we'll leave. Come back to whatever we want. Let's go through the book. Sure. And then maybe it'll pop up while we do it. So I was originally going to just ask you to read it and then ask you some questions. But in terms of editing, it'd be much easier if I just said, like, can you read this page? And then I asked you a question about it. For sure. So, if you'll go to this one. Which chapter? Oh, is that chapter? That's so <laughs> funny. Uh, the one that starts on the left with, but sometimes daddy cries. Okay. You want me to <laughs> Just read both read? pages? Yes, please. Okay. But sometimes daddy cries. He says he is feeling sad. Daddy needs rest, so he sleeps on the couch or in his bed. He can sleep for a long time. All right, so I want to ask about the word sad, and it is the exact word I would use talking to children about what depression is. But if you were talking to other people with depression or living with someone with depression or supporting someone with depression, how would you describe it differently? Ah, boy. Because it's so much more than sad. Yeah, it is the feeling of... Oh, Terry, you're asking hard questions today. I'm sorry. I'm a journalist. <laughs> so, you know, that's my background. If you're not no, up no, for it, I good. can keep it light. No, no, it, it's not that it's hard. It's like not emotionally hard. It's just my brain trying to operate hard. Okay. Today. okay. <laughs> uh, I would say it is debilitating. It is heavy. Mm. Uh, it's dark. Uh, sometimes it just feels like a vacuum, like it just, like nothing. It just feels like nothing. And when you think of nothing, like not, it's not even, it's not black, it's not white. You're you're just in a vacuum of nothingness, and it, that's scary. Feels, it feels like it's it's never ending. Even if you've only been feeling it for five minutes, it feels like this is the rest of my life now is going to feel like this. And I don't know how to, it's, I, this is just how I am now. Yes. So then your brain just starts a cyclone. Um, yeah, it is, uh, it is guilt. It is shame. It is unworthiness. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's sad, and it, all of it together just makes you feel really sad. If you feel anything. If you feel anything, that's right, yeah. It's a feeling of wanting to die, but not wanting to kill yourself, if that makes sense. It's like, oh, it does. a lot of times, that's what, to me, that's what suicidal feelings were. It wasn't, mm -hmm. I want to take my life. It was, I just don't want to wake up. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to disappear. I want to run away, never come back, and just live in a vacuum in a culvert in a ditch i don't care i i i want someone else to come in and kill me i yeah. i i want i want to die but i don't want to kill myself and i don't know if that's our brain's way of not taking our lives is it's like it's like it's a, it's a very it's a very thin line i want to die and i want to kill myself and it's like our brains quite often won't go over that line. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and I'm glad yeah. it doesn't. Uh, but alcohol and drugs and shame and guilt and dark and vacuums and all these things, mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. it's just too much. Um, yeah, it's exhaustion. Indeed. On, on, I, I describe it as on a cellular level. Right. There's tired yeah. that sleep helps. And then there's that tired of just, I am done. I am done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is the tummy one, just to make that comparison. Why can't I find that page? Um, let's see the one before. It's just words. So it's, it's, oh, after, it there it's only like two okay. pages after the last one. 
So you can you can start with the yeah, I try not to worry if it helps you to know, read into it as we say in the voiceover does. Oh. Get a running start. I try not to worry and hope Daddy will feel better soon. When I get tummy aches, I need rest too. Mummy says it helps me to feel better. Yeah. There we nice. Go. I like the me. All right, so let's talk about that comparison. <laughs> Thank you. I did. I like the up on the me. That's, that's usually how I read it. Great. One more time. Let's go up on the me. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about that. A tummy ache is something as, it's beyond common, right? It's a universal experience. Everybody's had a tummy ache, and you chose that, I'm sure, intentionally. So let's talk about that comparison yeah. and, and why. Um, well, one, I... I Grew up with a stomach ulcer as a little kid, so <laughs> it was very relatable, uh, which turns out it was because of anxiety, which turns out it was because of yeah. ADHD. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I don't know a kid that doesn't know what a tummy ache feels like. Sure. So I wanted something that, uh, you know, every kid can relate to or can understand so then they can put themselves there and be like, oh, okay. Oh, I've had a tummy ache. Oh, oh, so the, it, it, it's like this being sick in the brain or being mentally ill is just like this. And so, yeah, I just, I pick something that would be very common that everyone could relate to even a parent, even a parent that might not under have ever had depression or something. Even the parent can, uh, knows what a stomach ache feels like. Mm -hmm. Now I liked that. Cause it's, you know, you always hear diabetes, right? Everybody talks about diabetes. They go depression, diabetes, depression, diabetes. Well, I don't have diabetes, so I don't, and I don't know what it feels like, but boy, do mm -hmm. I know a stomach ache, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, well, how about just go to the next two pages? Cause I'm going to ask you to talk about the second one that doesn't have the illustration, but I don't know that I'll use it cause it kind of is the same point, but if you wouldn't mind, mommy says through daddy feels you want safe. Me to, to read them. Sure. Mommy says it's like when my tummy hurt so bad, I needed to see a doctor. Doctor said my body wasn't working right, so it made my tummy sick. Daddy's doctor said his body wasn't working right, and it made daddy feel sad. I like that. I like that a lot. I mean, it's because <laughs> even, even having depression, I don't give myself, cut myself the slack of just my body's not working right right now. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that was me yesterday, man. I, I was having a mental health day, and I turns out I forgot to take my ADHD meds. So then, partly withdrawal, probably partly, you know, I'm just not medicated. So then, all you know, symptoms act up, and then I was like, as soon as I realized, oh yeah, right, I, I forgot to take my pill this morning. That's why. That's probably. And then I was like, okay, I can deal with this. It's just a physical thing. It's fine. I'll be fine tomorrow. I'll take my pill, and off I go. Whereas in the past, I'd be like, I'm a piece of shit. What the f***? This is feeling, uh, this is just my life now. You know, like that never ending feeling. Yes. And getting, getting stuck and all that. Yeah. Ooh, yes. And, and I, <laughs> exactly <laughs> like feel it. and I appreciate you saying like, oh, wait, let me, let me take stock here. Cause I also had that the other day and I felt myself, um, really disappointing experience. And I was like, well, you know, one of those times where you're inadequate, 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 that's the word, inadequate. Hello. Hello. Oh, inadequate. Yes. As a man, sometimes you feel inadequate and the book helps you realize everyone goes through this. You're not inadequate. Oh, my God. You remembered the word. You know why you remember the word? You are not inadequate. Well, OK. Uh, when you said for. Oh, <laughs> Never mind. What, what? Were you going to argue with me? You, okay. Talk to my wife. Maybe um, she might have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're not going there. Um, grandma likes to visit. So, so yes. just that page. When he sat for a long time through even walk our dog. I'm going in order, by the way. Just uh, Grandma likes to visit. Rest for a long time. Daddy feels good for a bit. We play checkers. When he is sad for a long time, I go to school, play with friends, and even walk our dog. My guess on the why you wrote that is that it's okay for life to continue and that you can continue to do your thing and let the person recover. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. No, I mean, again, like if your parent was physically ill for a while, I mean, you don't like the world doesn't come crumbling down. You, you still do your stuff. You're concerned about your parent. You want them to feel better, but it's, um, 
you you know you're concerned for them you have empathy for them but it, it, healing takes time so you, you know that you know in a couple of days mommy and daddy will feel better again so i can i can go to school today i can still hang out with my friends i can play with the dogs um you know sometimes even walking the dog is helpful to my parents so you know i'll help out a little extra around the house doing this and that and um and yeah and that you know that in a few days they'll be up again because usually there is a pattern whether it's physical or or mental and um so yeah i'll i'll you know (laughs) i'm rambling aren't i no, <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm, what I'm thinking, it's so hard because there are some of us who, you know, I can hear, oh, I wish it only lasted a couple of days and I could get out of bed. But I do see an ebb and a flow and there are times it's like, oh, I cannot get out of bed. And there are days I wish I didn't have to or I'd really right. prefer not to, strongly prefer not to, but I can. Right. I have to do blank. I have to get the kids to school. I have to go to the doctor, you know, and you can drag yourself out. Right. So I, I do. I just thought that this seemed to be giving the kid permission to live his or her life. Yeah, right. I should say his it, or their life. It, yes. And not to say that the the dad is, you know, not sad or not depressed anymore, but, he, he, you know, in a few days he, he's feeling better enough to have his day be normal again and maybe have high functioning depression but he's no longer you know down and out laying on the couch not getting up not going to work for a few days so Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. so yeah that gives permission for other people to to go about their day be concerned have empathy but not have a dire i don't i don't know if that made sense yeah, there's not much they can do. No, I just wanted to make sure I was interpreting yeah. correctly because I read that. I was like, oh, you're giving them permission to go on with their yeah, life. Yeah. Well, I mean, as a kid, too, it's like, that's what else do you do anyway? Right. Well, right. And sitting in the house and, you know, like holding vigil would not be helpful. I know I would not because it's more work for, for the parents. I would hate that. Holding vigil. I like that. Oh, thank you. It's un, un, what the word? I forgot already. What was your word? <laughs> Un- inadequate inadequate oh that's why because it doesn't start with un that's why we couldn't come up with it yeah <laughs> it's in uh, in in um inadequate inadequate um, inadequate that would be, that <laughs> then you might be then you might actually be um yeah. how about the when we're getting to this page now where we talk about the actual hospital you you still yes. have time for this right i got all day okay you're nice how about that one cuz i just i think that we should talk about the experience of having to be in the hospital Sure. One time, Daddy got so sick, he had to stay in the hospital. Mommy said he needed special care from nurses, and everyone would help him feel good again. You read it sick instead of sad. Do you want to read it sad? No, I don't. No, oh, it's okay. It. I don't care. Nobody's, <laughs> unless they have the book in front of them, they'll never know. No, I've, uh, I'm supposed to be perfect. Um, <laughs> one time, Daddy got so sad, he had to stay in the hospital. Mommy said he needed special care from nurses, and everyone would help him feel good again. I struggled with that line because it was yeah. like, eh, we'll feel good again or good enough again, you know. But again, it's through the eyes of a kid, so. I like good enough. Um, but the hospital, that's a big one because that's scary. You know, when your parent goes to the hospital, when you go to the hospital, that's like next level. That's very different than being on the couch. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. That was your experience. Yes. You have been hospitalized twice, I think you were. Yeah. Twice, yeah. Uh, well, Technically three times, mm-hmm. I guess. Twice for depression, once for um, for drying out, for like um, detox okay. and stuff. But it, to me, it's all the same. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, how how was it explained to your children when you went to the hospital? Was it this? Um, I don't know what word to use. Easy? Was it this natural sort of like? And he's sick enough. He needs help from nurses and doctors now. Um, honestly, I don't actually know just because just I was in the throes of it. it. Um, but I remember coming out and talking to my kids and being like, um, yeah, I, you know, I was sick and I needed help. Uh, I'm not sure what my wife or my, my family said to my kids exactly when I was in there. I'm assuming it was very similar, mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, uh, daddy's not feeling well and he needs, he needs help from from doctors and nurses and uh, somewhere safe to be because yeah because he's sick do you say 
had attempted suicide? Is that something that's ever been shared or, or should be in your in your mind shared with kids? Um, that's scary. It is very scary. I actually didn't tell my kids. Um, trying to think, I can remember telling my youngest. I'm trying to think why I told him that. Oh. Uh, so I, 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 okay. <laughs> and you don't have to share, you year. don't have to share anything. You don't have to answer any question no, no, I, I ask. I, okay. Okay. Just, just I, I don't mind sharing. I'm just trying to get it okay. straight in my head when, how, when it happened. Um, so this, this happened when my kids were young, so we didn't tell them uh, exactly what was going on. Uh, I don't remember their exact ages, but it was like five and seven, something like that. Uh, and then I, about six years ago, I think my old, youngest was 10, um, 10 or 11. That's when I told them about the suicide attempt. Uh, and the reason I did that was because I wrote uh, an article. Um, it was actually, actually it was more like a blog post, like on Facebook. And um, it went viral mm-hmm. and like, media picked up on it and i mean there was news like i don't know how many news stations came out and interviewed me i was on the radio like i'm talking like tens of thousands of times it was shared this this blog post i wrote uh it was around the time that uh, robin williams uh, passed away Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so then i kind of came out i came quote unquote came out of the closet with my own um mental health issues which a lot of people knew uh, especially in the small town um, and no one would talk to me about it. Like they would talk to me about how my feelings up, but no one talked about the actual suicide attempt. Right. Uh, so then when I did that, it was like, um, yeah, it just kind of blew up, uh, for some reason. And I think it was because no one was talking about being suicide survivors. So candidly <laughs> at the time. And, uh, so then I thought, well, I better tell my kid. Because otherwise, he's going to hear about it at school from somebody oh, or yeah. someone. You know, someone's going to say something to him. So I better tell him. And and you know, like he knew I was in the hospital for depression. He knew I was, you know, all these other things. But he didn't realize there was an, an actual suicide attempt. And um, yeah, he, uh, yeah, it was kind of a heartbreaking moment. Actually, I, I he started wailing. Mm. That it sounds like a horrible conversation. It sounds so hard. Yeah. Well. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't like, I don't know. It was weird. I didn't, I didn't expect that reaction out of him for some reason. Like, cause we, we, we were talking so openly about mental health issues mm-hmm. and stuff as it was. So in, in one, in some ways I thought that he had kind of already put two and two together mm-hmm. or something or, you know, um, but I guess not. Uh, and I mean, he didn't wail for a long time and, <laughs> and I didn't deal with it quite right because i started laughing i was like oh no 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 they're there no it's okay buddy like i'm okay like look at me i'm okay right like this is you know and, and then he's like oh you know and then he calmed down but yeah mm. i'm i'm constantly you know i'm still making mistakes i'm, I'm only human <laughs> <laughs> we are hardly told how to do this and how to have that kind of conversation because people as you say don't have it earlier when you were giving that answer you said that people in your community knew that you had attempted but didn't talk to you about it. Should they? Mm-hmm. Like, why? It would never occur to me to say, so Todd heard you um, attempted suicide. Are you okay now? Or do you want to talk about it? Or I, I would imagine I wouldn't either. So what, what, would, what would you, what's good? What would have been good in your mind for someone to say to you? Ah, uh, boy. I guess, because I mean, some, some closer friends I knew, I mean, they would, talk about how I'm feeling and what happened but it was, even the temp part wasn't like talked about so much it was more like just how am I feeling and how am mm-hmm. I doing and, and why did I decide what what drove me to it you know mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean which I appreciated right because I, I do want some privacy too like I don't want to be talking I don't want to be going to the grocery store and talking about my suicide attempt no. especially right after it happened or you know um but I also a lot of people eventually once I wrote this other once this article came out and kind of went viral like I'm telling you people coming out of the woodwork in my community telling me they also 
attempted or they they thought about it or they've been you know they've had these feelings and stuff i would have been okay if someone who understood also came up and said oh you know i heard what happened and you know i've been there and, and stuff but instead nobody you know it's very hush hush nobody wants to talk about it you know and mm -hmm. until until you open up about it they won't approach you about it even though they knew right so right, right. um mm -hmm. i i would have i would have welcomed that i think i would have welcomed people coming up and being like i i understood you're in the hospital because of this and i've been there and i've done you know i've thought about it too and so it was mm -hmm. like until i openly talked about it there was no um camaraderie with other people about it a little bit but not not as much as once I wrote the article and actually kind of explained everything, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it was amazing because I mean, now I'm like, I have tight connections, even though we don't, I wouldn't call them friends, but I have these tight connections with people in my community now that I would never even considered having a connection with because they went through the same thing and they've sent me letters and they've opened up about their story to me as well. And so like, you know, we see each other on the street and it's like, you know, I don't have dinner with right. them. I don't text them or whatever, but there's this understanding. And it's like, you know, we give each other a nod or how you doing? And, and, and that could have happened years before, but it wasn't until I opened up that they opened up. So I don't know. It's, it's weird. <laughs> I don't know if that made any. It does. But I, I, I wonder if you and I knew each other and I saw you at the grocery store after I heard that you had attempted, I do not think I would say anything specific about it. I'd say, I'm glad to see you. I'm glad you're better. You know, maybe a hand on your arm or something, if that's even allowed these days. You know, I, I don't I don't know what I would say, and I do this. You know, I t these are conversations that I have, um, <laughs> and I wouldn't know if I was violating your privacy. I wouldn't know if I should say anything. So I don't know how someone who doesn't talk about it would know. Right, right. I get that, yeah. I mean, I'm the same way. I, I'd probably feel the same way. I'm like, mm. mm -hmm. um I'm not saying it was a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, it was just interesting that I, so many people knew, so many people have been through the same thing, but nobody mm -hmm. approached me mm -hmm. talking about exactly that hmm. until after I started talking about it openly, even though we all knew. You know? Yeah. I need to think more about that because I, I probably should come up with something better. I should have some way to have that conversation. And I, as of now, I don't. Me neither. All right. So... Uh, last three pages, starting with the sometimes he feels sad, just through the end, and I'll try to wrap this up. Okay. Sometimes he still feels sad, and that's okay. Mommy and I let him know we love him. When my tummy hurts, Daddy takes care of me, and I love him so much. When Daddy gets sad, I take care of him, and he loves me so much. Daddy loves me just the way I am, and I love Daddy just the way he is. Give me the why for ending it like that. Why ending it like that? Yeah, like how you chose those words, that thought. How did I end it? I don't remember. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, again, not to make it too devastatingly sad to let parents and children, and, you know, the parent that's suffering, the parent that's watching the other parents suffer, possibly letting the grandparents, letting the child, letting everyone that has a loved one that's going through this know that it does ebb and flow sometimes. It's not, it doesn't always end up disastrous. Um, and that not to take it personal, like, you know, not if, if, if your dad's going through this and it feels like, cause they can be irritable. They can be grumpy. They get, you know, maybe I should have added that in the book. Yeah. Uh, the irritability part and stuff. Oh my gosh. Um, yes. That, you know, you're, 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 whoever's going through this still loves you, even though it feels like they're avoiding you or they're isolating. And, and that if, if they do take their medication, if they do have space and support and they see a doctor or a nurse when they need to, that you can come out of this and that it's, it is just like a tummy ache, or at least it can be if treated, be like a tummy ache. And that you, there's there's always hope, and that you, you you'll always support them, and they'll always support you, and with the right with the right care and the right treatment and the right amount of love, you, there's hope. Terry. 
Terry, one of the things that just, you know, it jumped out at me the first time Todd talked and, and it really came through the second time was, you know, this idea that we are lovable even when we are sick. And I think it's because it's always been my biggest challenge when I have relapses, um, when I can't do anything and I can't help anyone um, to try to remember that my worth is not just all about those things, you know, what I can do and, and that, you know, reminding myself that I don't value the people that I value just because they can do things or that they, they can help me. Um, so remembering that, you know, we have worth and we have value in sickness and in health is important. Again, I think it's why this is so relatable to kids. I think it's also relatable to adults that we can get sick in a lot of different ways, but we can love people when they're sick too. Absolutely, I agree. And I think that if children get that message and have that understanding at a young age, they'll just go into life with so much more empathy and understanding for themselves mm -hmm. and for other people. So mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for that lesson from Todd and for you calling it out. Now, next week, we'll be back with another new episode. And this will feature a guest who's going to talk about patterns of thinking that both indicate and perpetuate a depressive view of things. For instance, the more you say to yourself that you're a failure, a loser, a burden, the more you're going to feel like one, particularly if your mood is already low. So that will be next week's episode. And as always, if you have any comments about this or any other episode, please go to givingvoicetodepression.com and record us some feedback using the record button in the upper left corner. Thank you. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate and reflect on your own experience with depression, or better understand how to support someone else who is struggling. If this episode has been of comfort or value to you, know that there are hundreds of others like it in our archive, which you can easily find at our website, givingvoicetodepression.com. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up, even if it's hard. If someone else is struggling, take the time to listen.